Muslims came back to hunt the descendants <coughs> of the Muslims and the Jews, now called Moriscos, Moors, the ones who are descendants. These are the converted Muslims to Christianity. They were called Moors. And that identity continued to the 16th century. So they knew who they were, okay? Uh, even if you're now born and raised and baptized as Christian, it doesn't matter. They know you're a descendant from this other, uh, from a Jew or a Muslim, because they keep a record of the genealogical tree. Because when they were conquering Al-Andalus, I said that last time, they were using the concept of purity of blood. So they were classifying population based on the concept of purity of blood. Purity of blood in the context of Al-Andalus meant that uh, if you have purely Christian blood, they won't surveil you. But if you have some grandmother or father or something like that that is Jewish or Muslim, then they will surveil you to see if you really converted or faking conversion. Okay? And they have all kinds of methods. And with my excuses to Foucault, uh, you know, Foucault sees this governmentality and biopolitics in the 19th century. And I always say that Foucault was worse than Eurocentric. He was French-centric. If he would be Eurocentric, he would have been better. Because he was seen that the methods that he traced to 19th century France were already there in 15th, 16th century Spain. The methods of surveillance of population were already there okay? uh, in the conquest of Al-Andalus. But he was so French-centric that everything he saw, he thought it was new and it was a French thing. Okay? Uh, uh, if it would have been Eurocentric, it would have been a little better. Okay? So, uh, so all these methods began way before, okay, in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, and the problem is that now you have uh, the concept of people without soul coming back to reclassify the converted Christians, descendants of the Muslim and Jews. And now they're going to call the Moriscos, who are now the Christian converted descendants of Muslims, or the Marranos, Christian converted descendants of the Jews. They're going to call them soulless people. Soulless people. So, someone speaks Spanish here? Okay. Sujetos desalmados. People without souls. Exactly. Or soulless people. Or you know? Soul. Okay. Because desalmados in Spanish, it, it, it has ambiguity. It mm -hmm. could sound like people without weapons, no? But it's not that. It's with an L. So it's, it's people without a soul. So it's, you know, desalmados, soulless, no? And so, uh, and so the, the thing is that, that now they're going to be classifying this population as soulless people. And now it doesn't matter if you are Christian or you know you baptize, etc. Now this is irrelevant. Because now this is the shift of the transformation from medieval form of religious discrimination to modern forms of racial discrimination. Because in the medieval times, Judeophobia and Islamophobia, going back to the Crusades was a form of religious discrimination. That is, I have the correct God, my God is superior to yours, I'm going to impose it on you, etc., and I'm going to try to convert you. Because you're a human being, you have a God, you have a religion, you have the wrong one, but I'm going to convert you to, to the real one, right? Because you're still seen and perceived as a human being. Despite that, the wars and the massacre, everything, you still, the attempt is to convert you. You don't convert, then I kill you, you see? Uh, because I want to save your soul from your barbarianism, right? So this is the logic, the genocidal logic that you see there uh, already in the, in the medieval time. But it was not racial because if you converted, it was okay. You see, if you convert and you and you then you can form part of the community of the Christians. Uh, if you converted and 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 you show you're not faking conversion, it's proven, etc. It's okay, okay. But now, this is a different narrative. But now it doesn't matter that you are already a Christian, you were born Christian, you were baptized Christian. You're soulless. So it's a more fundamental question of the humanity of the person. Because now it's not if you have the inferior God or you pray to the inferior God, it's that you yourself 
you are inferior because you don't have a soul. So here is a shift, a very important shift, where Islamophobia and Judeophobia from medieval times turned into racial. Even though the term might continue or the forms of discrimination might seem to be equivalent, they're not. There is a qualitative transformation with the conquest of the Americas and the narrative of people with soul and without soul now coming back to Andalusia and reclassifying the populations based on this concept. And now you have Christians, born and raised Christian, baptized Christian that are going to be classified as soulless people. I immediately go and enslave them. And there was a huge use uh, repression, uh, you know, of the of the Moriscos, the Moors, and the, and the Marranos, and until finally in 1607, they expelled them from the Iberian Peninsula. And the, the metaphors used to talk about them was using animal metaphors, like animal-like, you see? The concept of not having a soul put them in the, in the side of the zone of non-being, of animal-like people. So this is very important because we need to see the the how can I say, the mutual influence going back and forth between this conquest. You see, we cannot just look at going there, it's also coming back. It's new things emerging that come back and redefine what was there, you see? And so, so now, from then on, <clears throat> Judeophobia, Islamophobia, in the modern world, is going to be racial. It's going to be racial despite all the attempts by the European Union today, especially with the French and others, okay, empires, trying to claim that Islamophobia is not racist. Despite that, okay, they, you know, the, the, since six, the 16th century, Islamophobia is a form of racism. Now, this will require another lecture that I can do in the future, which is that we are so much tied to the idea that racism is about color <coughs> that we lose sight that racism has multiple markers in colonial history. In some places it's color, in other places it's religious identity, in other places it's ethnic identity. You see, but what is relevant is not the, the marker. The marker could be multiple. What is relevant is what is happening with that marker. If the marker is placing people below the line of the human and dehumanizing them to the side of the animal world, then and, and other people are being hyperhumanized as superior being and, and as equivalent to the human, then you have a racist structure. It doesn't matter if the marker is color of the skin, it doesn't matter if the marker is identity of your religion, religious identity or social marriage, it's ethnicity or whatever the marker is. If the whatever marker you use place you in this structure of superior inferior on the line of the human, you have racism there. And this is institutional. It's never just a, something about prejudice. It's more than that. It's institutional. The institutions of the society are enforcing this, you know? So this is another lecture that I cannot give now. But but the point is that, uh, I'm saying this because we are so tied into, especially in the Anglo-American world, we are very tied to the question of racism reduced to color. You know, because in fact, color has been fundamental in the modern world. We cannot deny that. This is a fundamental marker of race, okay? In, and some empires have put it out there in a stronger way, like the British, the Americans, etc. But there are other <coughs> empires that, they, that use other markers. You see, you need to look at this in a very careful way and, and, and see that the markers could be multiple. And therefore, you could have color racism as a marker in many places of the world, but you could have also the French, for example, they use a lot in many places the religious identity marker. Or the British in Ireland, they couldn't use color. They, the Irish are whiter than the British. <laughs> I mean, they, they couldn't use color. So what did they use? Religious identity. But when they, you see what exactly they're putting in place with the Irish over hundreds of years was a racist structure okay, of superiority and inferiority along the line of the human. Okay? 
Okay, so you have to look at this in a very uh, nuanced and, and, and complex way. We cannot fall into this, uh, how can I say, simplistic arguments about reducing racism only to color markers. There are many markers in colonial history, and we need to be careful looking at this. Okay, and and of course, if you have, if you happen to be, uh, you know, classified as black, and on top of that being Muslim, and on top of that being a woman, then you, you, are, you have a lot of oppression in your shoulders, okay? And then it doesn't matter how you try to escape here or there, you're going to be hunted uh, by the European Empire, it doesn't matter where you go. But anyway, uh, so the, the, the point is uh, that in this, this, in the early period, it was very clear that color was not the central question in the early period. It was more a theological racism, having a soul, not that kind of stuff. Marked through what? Through religious identity. That was the marker, you see? And through ethnic identity, that was the marker. Okay? And, and later, and here comes the other more historical consequence of the trial between Sepulveda and Casas. Now that they put the indigenous people away from slavery, and they put them in the encomienda, who is going to do slave labor? Here comes the industry of mass kidnapping of human beings from Africa to be transported by force to the Americas. That's what began there. Okay? With, it began before with the Portuguese in the 15th century, but the, the global dimension of the, of, the, of the thing began with the uh, Las Casas Sepulveda trial in the Spanish Empire. Because the Portuguese were uh, we're doing this at a regional level. You know, they were conquering the coast. Remember that the competition between European empires was who controlled the uh, markets of the East. That is, the, in the, the world production was centered in the East, in India, in Indonesia, in, in China, over there at the time. Europe produced <coughs> almost nothing at the time. So what they, the whole competition between the European empire was who got there first and brought those commodities to be sold here you know, and that was the competition. So that's why Columbus convinced the Spanish monarch to go over the Atlantic because the, the routes towards the coast of Africa to the to India or to the east were already controlled by Portugal. The the routes going the routes going to the east of the Mediterranean was already controlled by the Ottomans and by the Venetians and other you know. So so they were basically in, in circle and Spain Spain have no other than going through the Atlantic. Get the point? This is where, where, why the argument of this guy was convincing to them. You know, go to the Atlantic instead of, because you, you, you're, you're blocked from, the, from going the other way. That was their competition. So what they did was now uh, to, to bring, you know, kidnap Africans and bring them to Americas, to enslave the Americas. Okay? Uh, that the Portuguese began, but the global scale of the of the industry uh, was the Spaniards. Okay, and they kidnap people in Africa, free people, kidnap in Africa, and then transport by force to the Americas. So so far I have spoken about genocide, epistemicide in the conquest of Andalus, genocide, epistemicide in the conquest of the indigenous civilization in the Americas. And now you have another genocide epistemicide, the conquest of <coughs> Africa, the mass uh, kidnapping of people. We need to talk this way because it's what really happened. We cannot be euphemistic about it, you know. I never, I don't talk about slave trade. I think slave trade is the language of the masters. We have to talk about captive trade. These were not slaves in Africa. These were captive people. They were kidnapped, okay? and taken by force to the Americas. Oh, but professor, there were Africans uh, that were enslaving Africans, and the Europeans just came to the shores, and they were, you know, slaves in the shores saying, take me to a cruise to the Caribbean, okay? <laughs> in these fairy tales of Eurocentric revisionist history will be unacceptable if we were talking about the Jewish Holocaust. It would be a scandal if I tell you that because there were collaborators in the camps from Jewish 
collaborators in the extermination of Jews if I say that this was a Jewish project. That would be a scandal. The fact that you have collaborators in colonial domination doesn't mean that the project belongs to the victims of that process. You, you get my point? So you cannot say that the, the Holocaust is a, 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 a Jewish project because they were collaborators. It's a German project. I'm sorry, OK? Well, the same thing happened in Africa. There were collaborators from Africa of selling people to, to be enslaved by Europeans that, that entered into the industry of kidnapping. Of course, that was there, OK? But that also made the project an African project. That's a European project. But you still see historians, revisionary historians, saying, no, no, it was, you know, the Europeans just came to the shores to purchase slaves. As if they were some kind of innocent power. We, we just passed through the shore and they were selling us slaves and we, we just purchased them, you know, and brought them to America. We didn't know what to do with them. I'm sorry, okay? Don't, don't, you know, this, this, all these fairies are, seriously, they're, Historians today, revisionary historians, telling you this kind of <coughs> nonsense. Okay? Nonsense that they're mm -hmm. selling all over the place. And of course, one of the things you will hear, and please, Afrocentrics, if there are someone here, open your, your ears, okay? Because one of the things they're going to be telling you is that the Black enslavement began with the Muslim civilization in Africa. That's one of the things that they will be telling you. And then they will they're going to be telling you that uh, we just came late, we came to the shores, they were selling us slaves, you know, as innocent people coming there, and suddenly they were being sold slaves. I'm sorry, this was organized by Europeans. And what we call slavery in the past, and this is one of the problems we have with Eurocentric thinking, is that we fall into the traps of transhistorical uh, categories. That is, we say slavery, and then suddenly we saw that in the text in the 12th century, they were talking of slavery, and then we saw that in ancient Greece, you know, five centuries before Christ, uh, they talk about slavery, and then they, you see that, and then everything is slavery. And slavery is since Adam and Eve. And then you make sweeping statement that, oh, slavery has been there forever, okay? Well, this is the kind of logic that Eurocentric thinking love to sell. And love when they see someone from the colonized groups repeating it. Okay? They love this. <laughs> Because now you're going to do you going to spread white theory with a black face or with a brown face or with, you see what I mean? And so they love this. Okay? So be careful because you cannot collapse modern slavery that the Europeans put forward with slavery in Islamic civilization or slavery in the Roman Empire or slavery in the Greece or slavery in it's not the same. This is where it's different social system. I'm not defending any form of slavery, please. Okay? I, I oppose all of them. But I'm just saying you cannot collapse history this way. And they would be saying that Muslim civilization have the same type of slavery, racial, capitalist, and etc. Like 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 the European. So the European would say, after all, we didn't do anything new. That was already there. There were others doing it. Well, no. Modern slavery was racial <coughs> and was capitalist. Slaves had no rights. No rights. In Islamic civilization, slave was not racial and was not capitalist. And slave had rights. That's why you have many sultans that were born slaves and ended up being the sultan. How, how did that happen? Under our conception of modern slavery, that's Impossible, right? Because a slave in the Americas cannot become the president of the French Republic or the king of Britain. You follow me? That's, it's completely off because you, you don't have rights. You are like an animal, you see? You know, this child slavery, you know? And, and so this is a, a impossible, but an impossible. But in Islamic civilization, you have these other things. 
I'm not saying that it was good to be a slave in Islamic civilization, please, okay? I'm just saying it's different, qualitatively different. It was not racial, it was not capitalist. But they try to now flatten down history in such a way that they want to tell you that slavery was there since Adam and Eve, and it's the same. And we just came late. The moment you take that line of thought, you are colonized, because you're going to think that this is universal since Adam and Eve, and if this is universal since Adam and Eve, this is human nature, and if this is human nature, there's nothing you can do about it, except be sure you're on top and everybody's below you.